entire world is constantly evolving. As time moves forward, things change, which is why it's important to stay informed. Throughout the year, there are dozens of professionals that share their expertise with the community through lectures sponsored by local government agencies and area not-for-profits. And each month, SLC TV will feature one of these visiting professors as they discuss the latest current events. So grab a notebook and pull up a chair, because the lecture hall is about to begin. So my goal tonight is to kind of bring you up to speed on what I know about the algae blooms, our local algae blooms, and how those are related to human health. So please stop me with any questions. I tend to talk fast, and I want to tell you a lot of things. So if I get confusing or if you need me to circle back, please let me know. Um, before we start, though, I just want to briefly tell you about ORCA, where I work. Um, and has anyone seen Dr. Witter give a, a public speech? Um, so she does a really excellent job and she does a lot of community talks where she tells the whole story of ORCA. I don't have time to do that now, but I just want to tell you what we do at ORCA. We do what is called applied science or applied research. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the practical application of science. And so basically you can think of it as science for a purpose. So when we do a study, we want to have an actionable conclusion versus just basic science, which is extraordinarily important. It's how we learn things is basic science. But we, we um, have to have, we, our goal is to do, when we finish a study, is to have some sort of actionable results. And in our case, the purpose is to reverse the degradation of the Indian River Lagoon and other water bodies. So we're always focused on um, how pollution affects the ecosystem, and those of us who live around it. Um, so, so I like this quote by Albert Einstein. I think it's a really good way to describe what we do at ORCA. Uh, it says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. What we do is we try to provide the information that problem solvers need to solve the problems. So you can't solve a problem if you don't understand it. And the truth is there's a lot of things that are going on in the Indian River Lagoon that we don't understand. It's extraordinarily complex. And so that's what our goal is, is to provide decision makers the information they need to make informed decisions. Um, we work very collaboratively. We're kind of big picture. And we share our information with anybody and everybody who wants to know about it. So, but we are a rigorous scientific organization, and so we make sure that everything that we put out there, out into the public is very well verified and accurate. So to that end, I have to tell you that there's no real evidence that Albert Einstein ever said that quote, but it's just <laughs> such a great quote that I can't give it up. Um, so, so, we, so we're talking about One Health. Um, so as Ren told you, my background is in human nutrition. And so there's been this kind of carrot that's been hung out in front of me for, since I started working at ORCA 10 years ago, that eventually we would get back to looking, I could get back to looking at human health and how it overlaps with um, the environment. And after 10 years of working on developing methods and doing monitoring and assessment, we're finally there. And so what we, um, what we call our program at ORCA is One Health. And One Health is an international term that's used. It recognizes that there's an overlap between human health, environmental health, and animal health. But there's many people that are doing similar work and calling it different things. There's not an absolute way to talk about this. For example, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution just started their um, Center for Oceans and Human Health which we are going to be affiliated with, and they're doing the same types of work. But the reason why I like it is I like how it's cyclical. And what we're talking about tonight really is a perfect example of this. Because what's happened is human behaviors have caused an environmental problem. And that environmental problem is now having a really serious impact on human and animal health. So it's all related. We can't think about one without thinking about the others. So has anybody heard there's been some algae blooms? <laughs> um, it's been pretty bad. It was really bad in 2016, and it's really bad this year. And so what I want to start with before I start talking about human health is just what I'm calling algae bloom 101. 
just so if you have any questions, you can ask them and make sure you understand it because it's confusing and, and people are saying things that aren't completely accurate and it's, it's just a little um, overwhelming sometimes. So when we talk about algae blooms, there's a lot of different types of algae blooms, harmful algae blooms. When we're on the east coast of Florida, we're really talking about blue-green algae. On the west coast of Florida, it's an entirely different issue, but over here we're talking about blue-green algae, um, or blue-green algae blooms. But the first thing I have to tell you about that is they're not algae. I don't know where this came from that people started calling it blue-green algae, but it's not going away. <laughs> so, but just to be very clear, it's an actually a bacteria. And these blue-green algae are actually called cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria in and of themselves are not bad things. They're natural in the environment. And they actually have played really important roles in our environment. They're, um, they were, uh, they're believed to be the first photosynthetic organisms that existed on Earth. So they're responsible for changing the atmosphere of the Earth so that animals could evolve and plants could evolve. So when we talk about cyanobacteria, they're not evil little things. They just are out of balance. And they're significantly out of balance. We've had algae blooms, blue green algae blooms, for a long time, but we're, they're, they're larger than ever before, they're more frequent than ever before, and they're seen in places that they were never seen before. So it's a real system that's out of balance. Um, there's a lot of different cyanobacteria, over 6,000 cyanobacteria. So one of the things that when, when you, we talk about it, we tend to talk just about just a couple of them, but we, but we always want to keep in mind that there are a whole lot of different cyanobacteria. Um, and many of those cyanobacteria produce toxins. So before I talk about toxins, I just want to kind of tell the story. And you guys might already know this, um, but if you have questions, this would be the time to ask it. But so there's this normal system where we have a lot of phytoplankton, the, the, just the plants that, the tiny little plants that live and float throughout the water. And one type of phytoplankton are these cyanobacteria. But when we have this high levels of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, getting into the water, they feed that, those um, cyanobacteria till they rec create these great big blooms. And then there's all kinds of problems that happen. But then what happens is you have this big algae bloom, and then when the algae dies, it sinks to the bottom of the water, and it sits there. It decays, and it sits there. And it cr creates what we call muck, for lack of a better word. And muck is this really nasty stuff that is pretty much blanketing major portions of the Indian River Lagoon. So when I very first started working for Dr. Witter, we um, were going to go out and we were going to collect sediment and we were going to start looking at toxicity and a lot of different things. And so what our plan was that we were going to look for the bivalves that live in the sediment because healthy sediment has bivalves living in them and bivalves bioaccumulate. So we thought that would be a really good way to start looking at toxins. So um, having come from human health, I'd never gone out and collected sediment. And so when we started pulling up things that look like this, what we realize is there are no bivalves. In most of our samples, at most of their sites, there's nothing living down there. And the reason is because it's this muck. And muck comes from a lot of different things, but a lot of it comes from these dying algae, this dying algae that, de that goes down and decays. And so, oops, sorry. I forgot I don't have a um, pointer, but the, the picture on the left actually comes from Dr. Treffrey's work at FIT. But it shows you at the very bottom, pre-1950, that's what the sediment is supposed to look like. That's a healthy ecosystem. And so it makes its natural sand and shell. And that's what seagrass can grow in. That's what all the little um, benthic organisms like to live in. But over time, as we started moving in, we started developing properties. You can see that eventually we started um, having more clay, which is like what surf um, turf grass is grown in, that run, ran, ran off and got into the water, and then over time we started getting this muck. And so now when we go out and do our studies, we measure muck depth, and it's very, very infrequent we, that we don't see at least a foot or two of muck. And in some places we see as much as eight or nine feet of muck. Wow. We've lost a pole, like we put a pole down and we couldn't get it back up, it just sucked it up. And so there is a lot of muck that is blanketing the bottom of the Indian River Lagoon. 
And this is a problem because nothing can live there, but it's also a problem because it actually becomes a source of nutrients. So the nutrients, the nitrogen and phosphorus, build up in that muck, but it just doesn't stay there. It's re-released back into the water column. So it's this whole cycle where there's the nutrients causing the algae blooms that then die off and make this muck that contains a lot of nutrients, then those nutrients are released back into the water column that feed more algae blooms. So you can see we're just completely out of balance. And again, the muck is a huge problem. <coughs> so back to the toxins. So, so some cyanobacteria produce toxins. And these cyanotoxins are actually secondary metabolites that are produced by the cyanobacteria. So they're released into the water column when the cyanobacteria dies. And um, one type of cyanobacteria can produce a whole, uh, more than one cyanotoxin, and one specific cyanotoxin can be produced by more than one cyanobacteria. So um, the reason I'm telling you this is because we're, we make it seem much simpler when we talk about it in the news. Did you have a question? Um, Um, we have done a lot of research on that, and I'm going to touch on it at the okay. end, but that's not, I mean, there's, that's not the focus, that's not the right? focus. That's yes, right. yes, but there's a lot of people that are doing that, including us, and that is ultimately what we have to figure out and stop, but, um, <coughs> but this is specifically, I'm talking about the toxins okay. and the, um, but, um, okay, so, so cyanotoxins, um, so, so again, there's many different cyanotoxins. I just want to set that very clear because what I'm talking about tonight and what we mainly look at at ORCA and what most of the other organizations that you're reading about are looking at is one specific cyanotoxin, and it's called microcystin. And the reason we're looking at microcystin so much is that it's the most common cyanotoxin that we see locally. It's also considered the most um, toxic and frankly, it's the most well studied, so it's the easiest to study. The methods to analyze it are well established. And so we, we test it as, as kind of an indicator, but um, there could be others out there as well. But the reason that we know so much about microcystin is because, unlike some of the other toxins, it has both acute and chronic effects. So when you have exposure to microcystin, like we're seeing these blooms that people are exposed to, there's, uh, there's very significant immediate effects. So things like abdominal cramps, nausea, fever, um, uh, sore throats, hay fever-like symptoms, those are your acute effects. And there, there's been um, Martin Memorial, I think, is starting to track the um, admissions or ER visits that can be associated with the acute effects of microcystin. Um, but those symptoms usually clear up in about 48 hours. The chronic symptoms are much more serious. Microcystin is a known hepatotoxin. That means it causes liver disease. And so that's a pretty serious toxic um, impact from this little cyanotoxin. And so that's why we're so concerned about it. And some of, some of the ways that we know about what the effects of um, microcystin are come from animals. And I don't know if you guys, did you read in the paper that there's been some deaths of dogs that have been now clearly attributed to the microcystin? So it's pretty significantly toxic to animals. And this is actually a study that um, some, some information that came out of California in Monterey Bay. But what they found is that they started having this high incidence of sea otter deaths. And so what the researchers did is they tracked it back to bivalves that were bioaccumulating microcystin from these algae blooms that were coming in from through the freshwater tributaries. And so what they were showed is the effect on the liver. So in the necropsies of these um, otters, the, on the left you can see a healthy liver, and on the right you can see how the microcystin caused the hemorrhagic liver disease. So pretty serious impacts and pretty serious effects on the liver. 
Um, so when we come back to humans, this is really new work. So we're really only starting to look at these issues. Um, but this is a study that came out of some, some researchers did in from Ohio, University of Ohio. It was published in 2015. And what these um, researchers did is they just looked at two separate sets of data. They looked at the data that talked about the incidences of harmful algae blooms, and then they talked about the incidences of non-alcoholic liver disease. So, and then they plotted it throughout the whole United States. So what they plotted is areas where one was high and one was low, both were low or both were high. And you can see in Florida, there's one spot where they were both high, and that is where we are right now. It's the Treasure Coast from Martin County to Brevard and then Okeechobee. So this is not saying that, again, this is just looking at two different sets of data. There's no causative evidence. It's just showing that when this is happening, this is also happening. So it doesn't tell us anything um, dramatic, but it tells us that maybe we should look at this a little further and start taking it more seriously. So what needs to be done, and the public health issue is looking at the impact of these toxins on humans. And there's three main ways humans can get exposed, exposed to microcystin. The first way is through inhalation. Microcystin has been shown to be aerosolized. In a big bloom, when you have a really large algae bloom, it can be aerosolized. It was um, studied in 2016. I don't know, I, can't, I was trying to remember who um, Martin County contracted to do this work, but they did find microcystin through aerosolization, um, and it was at 0.64 parts per billion. So it was pretty low, but, um, but and no one knows what does that mean, like how to interpret that, how um, serious is that, is that something to be concerned about or not. But we do know that it can be aerosolized. So the best recommendation is don't breathe it in, don't be close to it and try to avoid um, uh, inhaling around high levels of blue-green algae. Then the other ways that you can get exposure is through recreational exposure and through consuming something that has microcystin in it. And so the um, recreational s exposure, sorry. So the recreational exposure, again, this is really tricky stuff because the, there's been a limit set at 10 parts per billion. And that's talked about a lot when you read in articles in the newspaper, you'll, it'll say this is 50 times higher than the um, recommended level and those types of things. But it's really hard to measure to get an accurate assessment of microcystin in the water because you can't, it's not a, it's not a consistent thing. So just as an example, I was, I'm going to talk about work we did this summer in Blue Cypress Lake. Has anybody been out to Blue Cypress Lake? Isn't it fabulous? Before, it, yeah, it's absolutely incredible. When we first started going out this summer, it was when the, um, all the baby ospreys had just hatched. It was the most magical thing I've ever seen. There were just hundreds and hundreds of babies, and it was incredible. So, That's in Florida? yeah, it's in western Indian River County. You need to go next summer. It's really, really worth a visit. Um, but we had been in contact with some people who lived out there. There's just a little village of some small little homes. Um, they're all, the, they, they went on to sewer. They really have worked very hard to keep this a beautiful, pristine lake. It's actually the headwaters of the St. John's River. And so what happened, so, so when this woman contacted us and said, in, in the middle of the lake or kind of the um, southwest corner of the lake, there's been this big algae bloom. We asked her if she would get us a sample because she was out there. And so that's the picture on the left. And so we tested that sample. So we took a sample and it had a very large concentration of cyanobacteria cells. And so we lysed the cells. They basically broke open and killed the cells. And then we measured the microcystin in it. The purpose of doing that is we wanted to know how toxic this algae bloom was. It was a brand new algae bloom, probably very few of the cells had actually died off. And so we did that, and it had 4,700 parts per billion. Wow. So it was super high, but we weren't ever saying the entire lake had that much. We were just saying that's how toxic the, um, the, the um, bloom was. Well, then, like a week later, DEP went out, and they tested in other areas, and they found no microcystin. And so then there was this big debate over who's right, DEP or ORCA, 
And the answer is we both were. So it, there isn't just, you can't ever go out and just take one sample and let it tell you what's going on with the microcystin. So just a couple other examples. The pictures, a um, later in the summer we were out, and the bottom left, we saw an algae bloom. We took a sample, <coughs> no microcystin. We sent it off to get the algae species identification, and it wasn't the type of algae that produces microcystin. So that's not surprising. But then we took, a week later, we took two samples and at this point, it was just kind of green floating on the very top of the water. And one had no microcystin. The other one had 18.6, so almost twice as high as this 10. And it just because the cells had lice. And maybe these, these on the left, it had already released all of its toxin, and that toxin was floating away, or there maybe was still a little bit in this one. So it's really, really complicated stuff to try to figure out how to test for these things. And the only reason I'm going into this great detail is if you're reading something in the paper, and, and they're making it seem like one test is telling you the beginning and end of the story, you know that it's not. And if they're asking why one person got one thing and one person got another, it's because it's really complicated and, they, it, and they're often different. So when it comes to recreational water, again, I think the best advice is if there's an algae bloom going on, don't get in it. Mm -hmm. And then, and we don't have to spend all of this time and effort always trying to um, kind of figure out, are we above or below 10? So that comes to the consuming part of it, which is where we are really focused um, in our One Health program. And there has been a level of one part per billion in drinking water, set at drinking water. So just to put this in perspective, one part per billion would be one drop in that entire tanker truck full of water. So it's a very, very low concentration. But even that, that one part per billion is actually designated as a provisional guideline. And what that means is that there's a high degree of uncertainty. So the truth is, no one knows. We know that if it's safe at any level, it's a super low level. But there's really not strong enough evidence to know what level is safe, and especially if it's, if it's exposure over time. So lots of work still needs to be done. Well, you said exposure over time. Does that mean your body never gets rid of it? It's so, so that's a really good question. And again, we're not entirely sure, but toxins, we do, we're, we're extraordinarily robust mammals. We've, we've lasted this long and we have a, exposed to a lot of different toxins. So it probably has to do with what other toxins you're exposed to, how healthy you are, how healthy your liver is. So, th so it's not a real simple, um, a simple answer, but, but you should be able to detoxify if it's, it's, if you just have a little bit once in a while, your liver should be able to de um, detox it, but I can't say for sure, because I mean, in dogs, these dogs died really quickly. Mm -hmm. So, but, but when we talk about exposure, there's chronic exposure and then there's acute exposure. And so I think what we really, what I'm personally concerned about is chronic exposure. Because if they're getting exposed to microcystin, or if any of us are getting exposed to microcystin, we're likely getting exposed to other things as well. Um, so when we talk about how we get it into our bodies through Consumption, certainly drinking water is one, but we do have, I mean, hopefully our, um, and, and we are very confident that locally our water treatment plants, there's no microcystin getting into the um, water system. Um, but it can get into our food, uh, food chain, and particularly what we're looking into is the um, aquatic food chain. And so there's something called bioaccumulation that happens in seafood. What this means is you, you have on the very lowest end of the um, aquatic food chain, you might have small amounts of microcystin, but as you move up the, to, to the larger and larger fish that most people consume, it's going to be bioaccumulated over time, and so you're going to get a much higher dose of the microcystin if you eat fish that, are, um, that have been swimming in water with microcystin. And there's a big body of evidence that fish and different um, seafood does bioaccumulate microcystin. Um, the other way that we can get food, uh, microcystin into our bodies through eating is through um, plants that have been irrigated with water that contains microcystin. 
So again, there's a big body of literature, or a fairly big body of literature that has demonstrated that at least a, a significant number of plants do, that are watered with wa irrigation water that has microcystin in it, that that uh, microcystin can get into the edible portion of some plants. And so when you think about these farms, you, if you drive around and see farms, you often see these types of canals where the irrigation water is taken out of, and it's not uncommon to see um, some green scum on the top that could be cyanobacteria. And this is a big issue locally because the way that um, we've, we've drained the land, we have all these different canals, so a lot of times farms do use those irrigation canals for watering their crops. And a lot of the, um, we're getting more and more row crops locally as the citrus crops are going away. So we don't know that it's a problem, but it certainly needs to be looked into. And, and if, if it is a problem, we need to identify solutions. Um, so, so this is really an interesting story. This is a study that was published last year, last December. And it was a really interesting study because it not only showed how the microcystin can actually get into the plants, into the edible portion of the plants, but it also, also showed how there was an impact of microcystin, uh, when you had microcystin in the irrigation water, there was an impact on the growth of the plant. So you can see how the higher the concentration of microcystin in the irrigation water, the more poorly the plant grew. So just kind of hypothetically, you would think that if a farmer is completely unaware of this, which they probably are, your plants aren't growing very well, you may think they need more fertilizer. So you add more nutrients to the system, which there could be more runoff that would feed more algae blooms that would then put more, you know, so, yeah. so again, it's another one of those loops that we get ourselves into that we have to figure out what's going on so that we can stop it. So this is, so I'm now going to tell you what we are doing specifically at ORCA, the studies that we're doing. Again, it's a new program. I personally think it's a very, very important public health issue that lots of people need to get involved in. Harbor Branch is working on this. They, they um, I don't know if they had an article in the paper earlier in the week. Um, and so I should back up and say the other thing that we do at ORCA is we don't duplicate efforts because there's so much that needs to be done. So we, all, we always try to do the things that other people aren't doing. But what we are doing with respect to microcystin in the food chain, our first grant came from the guardians of Martin County. So we just started with collecting fish. So we have collected um, about 57 fish throughout Martin County. We had some fishermen that helped us with this, and then we sent people out fishing. It's a hard job. Um, but so we brought the fish in, and we um, took samples of the skin, the liver, and the fillets, and we um, homogenized them and extracted the um, microcystin and tested for microcystin. So we're just finishing up that portion, and that data will be ready probably by the end of October. We're going to um, share it, give it to the funder first, but then we'll be putting that out in um, a variety of ways. Um, and what we're going to do is kind of try to share, to f calculate how much microcystin you would get in like a portion, an edible portion of the fish that you eat. And then we're also, the next step now is we're going to start looking at the possibility that microcystin is getting into food crops. And so the way we're doing this is we're testing water samples in a, in a variety of ways in, in canals that we know are used for irrigation. And then we are planning to work with some farmers and try to get a handle on growing um, on, on some of their plants that they've grown. We have grown a number, we've done a number of studies, controlled studies, a lot, mainly to work out methods. So we've grown a lot of plants in our labs and, and behind our um, facility to demonstrate that we can test microcystin as it's incorporated into these plants. So those are the two big studies that we're doing that were funded through the Guardian of Martin County as well as some individual donations. And then the next study that we're just started this summer is um, something that I'm particularly interested in and it's looking at what we call subsistence fishing communities. So subsistence fishing communities are just or subsistence fishers are people who fish for their main source of protein or for one of their main sources of protein. So it's not like a sports fisherman. Um, and there's been quite a bit of research on, in general on these communities, and it's estimated that they eat about eight times as much fish 
as the average American. So if, if, if um, microcystin is getting into fish, then this population is going to be particularly at risk because they um, are getting so much more of it. And so we are doing, we got our funding for this project through the Francis Langford Fund, which is funded through the Martin County Community Foundation. And so we're doing this project out in Indian Town. Primarily, we've been working out at the Mayaka Lakes, which is right there at Lake Okeechobee. And so this is just an example of a gentleman that we met um, who was fishing. And you can see back behind the cyanobacteria, right, on the water. And so um, for this particular study, this is our first study in this project. Um, in, and so what our, we're doing is, the first thing that we're doing is getting information from the fishers. So we're, we're, our goal is to talk to 50 different fishing fishers. And we did half of them. We were, we were at 27 we did for the summer. And then we're going to do the other half in the winter. But what we're doing is just gathering information about their fishing practices. So how much they fish, where they fish, what fish do they collect, catch, what parts of the fish do they eat, um, who else in their households eating the fish, those types of things. And then simultaneously with that, we're catching fish and testing them. So if they're catching crappie, we're catching crappie. So, we're, so we can kind of start to put the pieces together. And so the goal of the study is to estimate the ra rate of exposure of this particular fishing community so we can get a handle on what is the real situation because no one knows if it's even a concern. And so, I'm sorry? We're catching them from where they're catching them. Yes, we're out there. We had this fabulous fellow. I, she just left, but she would fish for 12 hours. And she, so it's been really great because um, this is a really, really interesting community and a wonderful people. And she's, she was at right out there with them. So we're getting quantitative data and qualitative data, but we're also getting really excellent analytical or um, anecdotal information. And I think that's really important when you start working with people because we can't just say, oh, this is unhealthy fish, you can't fish here. This is a huge part of their culture. And there were people that were coming up from Fort Lauderdale at like 1 o'clock in the morning, and they were saying, you know, this is a generational thing. And so we need to solve these problems. If there's a pro an issue, we need to solve the problem for these people. We just can't say, stop fishing. Um, and so we're, we're doing, we're right there beside them. And in some cases, they gave us some of their fish, or they gave her some of their fish. So we're really going to miss her because, um, I mean, we got to know some of the people as well, but none of us were out there fishing for 12 hours. So we will be. Um, so, so one of the outcomes of this study that I'm really excited about, so we always communicate our results with decision makers, and but, but Working with the Martin County Community Foundation is really, really excellent because they do a really good job of putting different organizations together. So they put us in touch with uh, other so social service organizations that work with these same communities <coughs> so they can help us talk to them and problem solve. But what we really are um, excited about doing is starting to work with the medical community so that we can give them information about their population that they're seeing. So we're saying, you know, this, they're giving this hepatotoxin at this fairly high level, just start looking at liver enzymes, so that type of thing. So it's, again, it's brand new. We're just getting off the ground on this, but it's pretty exciting, and it's definitely the area that I'm most interested in working. It's, it's the nutrients. It's nutrients, so I'm getting to that. Let's, um, okay, so let's talk about solutions. So, so um, we have this potential public health problem. We know we have this algae bloom problem. So what are solutions? So ORCA focuses on what we call upstream solutions. So when you think about this upstream metaphor, it's kind of tracking it down back to its source. So when you talk about oops, um, upstream um, solutions, they're more efficient, they're more effective, and they're permanent. So it's not like just treating a symptom, trying to solve a problem. But often there, it's, it can be very challenging. And oftentimes, you start to solve a problem 
and it brings more problems to light. So they're complex. Um, so I like, I found this cartoon and I think it's a good example of how we end up working at ORCA. It says, it's like a newscaster and she's saying, a quadruple environmental tragedy here today, Brian, as a whale tangled in a tuna net full of dolphins beached itself on top of an egg laying sea turtle and was hit by a gas <laughs> bezeling SUV. I mean, that's sort of how we feel when we're doing our projects because we're trying to look at the big picture and then this relates to this and we got to worry about this and solve that problem but it's the only way that we can do these projects and get actionable results and so really focusing on upstream solutions so when we're what we're talking about tonight the upstream solutions takes you back to those nitrogen and phosphorus the upstream solution is to lower the nutrient loads in the water and so how do we do that? We gotta figure out what the sources of nutrients are. And there's many potential um, sources. And the thing about working in the Indian River Lagoon as opposed to like Blue Cypress Lake, I mean in Blue Cypress Lake it's much easier. It's a smaller um, water body and we can figure out there was never these big algae blooms before, now there is, let's figure out why much simpler than this entire lagoon. So what we know is that different areas have different major sources. So we just have to start chipping away at it. So whether it's in agriculture, whether it's through um, row crops or other crops or livestock, whether wastewater, whether it's septic or sewer, we're looking a lot at reuse water and, and, um, and biosolids and things like that. So, so it's not real straightforward. There's sort of this raging debate that septic's better, sewer's better. Again, nothing is that simple. And then in, in some cases, it's air pollution. It's actually ap atmospheric deposition of nutrients. And then the muck itself. Remember I told you that the muck itself is sometimes the most, the largest um, source of nutrients. And then the non-agricultural runoff, which is where um, we can focus kind of in the short term. So what we want to do is just figure out the 80-20 rule. What we, can we do that's going to have the biggest effect? And so the approach is, this is an example from Chesapeake Bay, which I don't know if you guys know, but Chesapeake Bay is recovering. Yeah. And it's because they took this very methodical approach and they tried to figure out where the nutrients were coming from. So this is an example of, of what they did with nitrogen. So um, for example, if you look here, you know, if someone came in and said, Septic tanks the problem. Everybody get off septic tanks and the problem solved. You look at the reality and only 4% of the nitrogen. Not that that's a good thing, right. but, but that's not the solution. So that's what we're trying to do locally is figure out what the major, so major sources are in each individual area. So what you can do as an individual, um, the main thing is to educate yourself, stay informed and vote because ultimately these are gonna be policy issues, policy solutions. But from an uh, um, individual standpoint, reducing nutrient inputs in any way you can. And one of the biggest things we find, and it seems so silly and so simple, but grass clippings are a huge input into the lagoon. So when you think about it, turf grass is invasive. It's not a natural thing. It shouldn't be here in, in Florida. And so you picture every house along the water or that's anywhere near a storm drain and all that grass that has gone into the lagoon over all these years, it's a big problem. And so simple enough, quit putting your grass in the water. And, but, but I've never ever been in the field that I haven't seen floating grass on the water. And so that's something that we can all do right away that, you know, it's not gonna change things overnight, but it's gonna stop a, an input and then on the other hand is what our backyards I mean if, you, if we live on the water we should not have sloping lawns to harden shorelines but most people do so so living shorelines are the best this middle map is one of our pollution maps it shows nitrogen and it's just one of many that where you can see this classic example on the um, west coast it's all living shorelines and you can see that it's healthy, but when you go over to the east side of the lagoon, where you have these bulkheads with these big yards with grass, it um, slopes right in, and that's, then you have your accumulation of nitrogen. But what's really good about this one, if you can see like that little thing that 
pops out in the middle. This is, that's actually the moorings in Vero Beach. And that is the golf course. And so it, it's, you can see that it's healthy because it's surrounded by mangroves. And it's also a Audubon certified golf course. And so that's an example of having a beautiful golf course lawn, but following specific practices that you're not putting nutrients into the water. I am talking about, um, um, like on the right side in the middle, the thing that kind of pops out. Yeah, it looks like a jetty. That's the golf course. Sorry, I have a um, I have a sword. <laughs> In case, thanks. So right here. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so right there. Yes, ma'am. So interestingly, so um, the there's a group or a um, community within the moorings, and I don't know exactly where it is. It's somewhere in this bright red area. But when they saw that map, they contacted us and they changed their shorelines. They took out, they, they put in a, um, like a buffer zone. And so you don't always have to get rid of your whole bulkhead. So you just can do, you can put in different plants or different things that catch the runoff and catch the nutrients. And so over time, as more and more people do this, it's going to train it back. So absolutely. So there's many people working on this, on living shorelines and native plant um, backyards and <coughs> things like that. And so I think we just have to all work together. And so what we really try to do is get the science, again, to demonstrate the impact. Because we'll go back now in a year or so and be able to show a change over time when they change their life.